Welcome to the third season of Stories to Share. I am Joe Steinfield, and I am the moderator of this series, which for those of you who have been here before know very well, has had some outstanding speakers. And the only requirements to speak as part of our program is that you live around here in the Monadnock region and that you have a story to share. You would lead an interesting life, something that all of us will enjoy hearing about and we're going to get off to a very good start today. This is the speaker series that stands alone. <laughs> Those who laugh may know that the movie, The Mountain That Stands Alone, is competing with us. They scheduled it for some reason on our Friday, and apparently some others as well, but I'm very pleased to see all of you, as well as people who are joining us online. Before introducing our speaker, uh, a few preliminaries. If you saw the screen that was up earlier, you saw that we have a wonderful slate of eight speakers. First Friday of the month through the month of May. I won't jump too far ahead except to say that next month we will have Cy Montgomery here talking about her latest book. And I can assure you, those of you who've read her books or know her, uh, will nod your heads that it will be an interesting hour with her. Before I get to, to Kurt, I want to say a couple of words. One about Rebecca Fredrickson, who was the executive director of this organization from the time we started three years ago and who left a few months back and now works for Catholic Charities. She had a long commute. Uh, and now she's closer to home, but it is really thanks to her in large part that this series got off the ground and has managed mostly to uh, work out pretty well from month to month. And it's also due to Ed Watazek over here who comes from Chelmsford to and brings all this equipment with him. And what that does is create uh, the ability to have our programs online, then they go up on YouTube. We can all next week watch you again. <laughs> uh, one other comment that I want to make, this is a personal comment, and it may or may not register, but one of the biggest fans of this series was a guy named Eddie Ginsberg, who started coming to Jaffrey when he was one. He died last spring at the age of 90. He was a well-known Massachusetts judge, somebody I knew, because that I used to work in Boston uh, very well for 50 years. And when I told him a few years back that, you know, we ought to have something in the season when the Amos Fortune Forum and the Monadnock Lyceum are not providing speakers. We can get local people. And he gave me a sort of judge's skeptical look, as if to say, ah, I don't think so. And then ate his words and never missed, never missed a single program. Uh, his widow, uh, his daughters are still on Thorndike Pond in the summertime. And he was really a special guy who loved the town of Jaffrey. Uh, one last preliminary I want to mention that was on the screen before, which is that Beltetz is sponsoring this season. Uh, the speakers do not get paid. They volunteer. And we're grateful for that. But of course, there are costs associated with anything of this sort, and thank you, Beltetz, for stepping up and sponsoring stories to share. Now, to today's speaker. He grew up in Allenstown, New Hampshire, and he went to Pembroke Academy. 
and I checked into Pembroke Academy, and the motto is work hard, be respectful, be a Spartan. Well, I don't know about the Spartan part, uh, but having spent a little time with Kurt, and I know you have family and friends here, uh, the work hard part seems to have uh, clicked with him. His father had a movie theater on Loudon Road in Concord. And so he used to work in his dad's one screen movie theater. And his ambition was to become a projectionist. And you had to be in the union to do that. And so he started moving boxes, doing whatever needed to be done, and also serving as a stagehand at the Capitol Center for the Arts. His brother was a Keene State, so Kurt came over to Keene one time, and he was going to the movies, and the film broke. Have you ever been someplace to say, is there a doctor in the house? You know? <laughs> well, he's the film doctor, and he went up, and he patched the film, spliced it, and became the projectionist at the Colonial Theater. And he started doing a little moonlighting because the pay was steady but wasn't great. And the next thing you know, he worked on a traveling national company of a Broadway show. And then one day, the phone rang from Gillette Stadium. And it turned out Metallica, how many of you know Metallica, hard rock, yes, was coming to Foxborough. And whoever called said, we need 50 people down here. And he said, you got it. And that was the first major show of Steelman Productions that has grown and grown and grown to the point where it now does all of the non-baseball events at Fenway Park, uh, does an event every year on the Charles River near Harvard Stadium called Boston Calling, and puts together everything that is needed at any given venue to make it work. So I asked him, Did you, do you meet famous people? And he said, oh, yeah, a few. I said, well, who? He said, Johnny Cash. I thought, hey, that's good. <laughs> who, uh, how about Willie Nelson? He said, yeah, many times. So now I want to be him. <laughs> It's a great pleasure, Kurt, to welcome you to Jaffrey, to Stories to Share. Welcome, Kurt Steelman. Thanks, Joe. I, the story's pretty much done. I, I, <laughs> so, uh, my name's Kurt Steelman. I am 55 years old. I was born in Concord, New Hampshire, in uh, this month, in the year 1967. Um, I am, let's see, <laughs> I had put this together, uh, but I'm, I'm uh, trying to remember how I did that. So this is the company that I founded and, and own, uh, president and chief operating officer. Um, and again, I, I was born uh, 1967, one of four brothers, one of which is in here tonight. Uh, hopefully, I was, trying to, I was trying to embarrass him a little bit. Uh, that's quite a long time ago, uh, a little bit more current. Uh, my mom and dad and uh, the four of us. Um, my parents met in Manchester, New Hampshire. My mother was working at a Dunkin' Donuts on Elm Street. My father was uh, the manager at the Empire Theater. Uh, they fell in love. Uh, got married and pregnant, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> and uh, my brother Greg was first, and then I came along. He was there for uh, several years, and in the, uh, I believe it was the early part of 1967, there was an opportunity to, uh, oh, my kids. <laughs> My son Elliot, who's here tonight, and my other son Owen, who couldn't join us because he's skateboarding in North Carolina. 
Um, in any event, back to uh, my dad. He was managing the Empire Theater and had the opportunity to um, uh, manage Cinema 93, which was bound to open in uh, April of 1967. I came along in October of 67. Uh, that theater operated as the uh, premier movie theater in, in Concord. Uh, had about 400 seats. Um, have very fond memories of, of growing up in that environment. Uh, saw a lot of movies. Um, one of which was uh, uh, in the spring of 1977, a film called Star Wars started there. And we had no idea what was coming. I don't think my, my father had any idea what was coming, but it was a, a massive success. Um, and that picture goes back uh, at some point in the 70s. Um, but yeah, I spent my, my formative years were there, and, and I, I, I like to think that, or I know for a fact that who and what I've become over the years was broadly shaped by my being raised in this environment. Um, and I couldn't give you all the details on that this evening, but uh, definitely being in, in show business uh, is in the blood. Um, <coughs> Cinema 93 operated until 1999 and closed his stores, and my father went on to uh, have a video store in uh, Concord. That lasted several years, and he also founded the Red River Theaters, which exists now on the main street, and he is still part of that. Um, Star Wars 77. Long lines. We, uh, we got hired uh, by my father, uh, my older brother Greg, myself, my younger brother James, <laughs> we got hired for a dollar a day to clean the ship, to clean after the shows. <laughs> there you go, Pop. <laughs> uh, yeah, back then, uh, one, three, five, seven, and nine. Those were the show times, and uh, uh, we were cleaning up. And in, in this after school, the, the one, threes, and fives, and typically going home after that, uh, I would take the dollar and go next door to. King's department store and either play asteroids or buy a uh, uh, 45 or, you know, it was, it was a fun, fun experience. Um, and I, like Joe had, had said earlier, <clears throat> I was fascinated by what was going on in the booth and how the film was being shown. Uh, when you're a kid, you don't realize, you know, how a movie gets onto the screen. And I had, you know, that backstage knowledge, the projection, projection booth knowledge. It, it was up there, and there was a guy working, and he had to make a changeover and keep the thing lit. And uh, that's, I decided that at an early age, that's what I wanted to do. Um, I think I started off as a ticket taker uh, before the projectionist, but uh, that was, uh, I learned a lot of, people skills, you know, opening a door for someone, taking their theater, walking them, you know. Uh, anyway. Uh, the other interesting thing about the theater was my grandfather, his dad, uh, Arthur. Arthur had an uncanny resemblance to Alfred Hitchcock, <laughs> as is noted by the statue there, sitting there. Uh, he was kind of a local celebrity, and... Uh, he also was a huge part of uh, all of our lives and uh, uh, just such a character. Um, as a result of working at Cinema 93 and becoming a projectionist, I was able to work at the drive-ins, which was a completely uh, alternate um, reality. You weren't confined to a, a building with patrons that were behaving themselves. You were, had people in their cars honking their horns, uh, throwing food at 
uh, the projection booth occasionally a firecracker or two through the portal and uh, typically some un unruly uh, moviegoers. Uh, I think that we're probably less interested in what was playing and what was going on in the, in the uh, parking lot. Uh, so from that point, yeah, I was working at the, uh, because I was a union member, I was uh, asked to work as, in a stagehand capacity at the Alosa Theater, which is now the uh, uh, Capital Center for the Arts. I did quite a few shows there in my youth. I was, uh, um, I think I was more intimidated as a stagehand then than Ever, I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, just constantly being told, you know, how I was screwing up. Um, but it was it was a union gig. It paid fourteen dollars an hour, and it paid cash at the end of the day. Glenn, don't quote me on that. Uh, and it, it was an exciting, uh, exciting way to spend, uh, to get paid and and to spend working. Um, that is premature. <laughs> so uh, I did get out of the union. Uh, there were some things going on that um, I decided it was not really the best way for me to uh, move forward um, in a career path. Uh, not that I knew what path that was going to take, but uh, decided I didn't want to be a part of the union any longer and turned in my card. I still worked at my father's theater, uh, but the, the union portion of that, it kind of vanished as technology brought uh, being a project projectionist and projecting a film much easier. So you didn't need the skill level that, that you necessarily needed years earlier. The drive-ins had closed. Um, So I kind of floated around for, for several years. Uh, I wouldn't say aimlessly, but just, you know, working, doing uh, whatever I could, wherever I could, until uh, the fateful day that I slept on my brother's sofa in Keene, uh, New Year's Eve, 1995, and uh, never left. And was working at the Keene Cinemas there for a short stint. Uh, I had interest in working at the Colonial Theater, but for some reason they were not interested in having me work there. However, that one night when I went in to watch a film, I was sitting there in the balcony and the film broke, and a friend of mine named Ken Arnold had come out and he was working there as an usher slash, um, I think he was working in the ticket booth at that point, and he announced, you know, the film's not coming back up, she's having problems, and I, I said, uh, I can help. So I went upstairs, put the film back together, got it back on the screen. The next thing I knew, there was a guy busting through the door, and he's saying, you're my new projectionist. <laughs> I said, OK. Uh, <laughs> so I took the job. Uh, <clears throat> he was. Uh, trying to convince me to work live events, which I wasn't, uh, I wasn't too keen on, no pun intended. Um, and there came an event that he needed, you know, several uh, dozen people for, and I said, sure, I'll help out. And within a few shows, I did that show, I did a few more, next thing I knew I was the, uh, head rigger on the fly rail. And then within a few months of that, I was getting tapped to be the production manager, which was absolutely terrifying. I was asked if I could do the job, and I said, sure. <laughs> um, had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Made several phone calls and um, uh, asked a lot of questions. Um, and I got it after a while, so 
that lasted for from like 2009 till about, or no, I'm sorry, 1999 to 2008. I was a production manager over there. Um, had a lot of success in that role. Uh, we had several Broadway shows which required a high number of staff to come in and I was um, filling those calls uh, by making the phone calls and calling people that I knew or didn't know or you know there were people on the street that I would say hey what are you doing you come to work uh, and word got around that I was able to put 30 40 50 people uh, backstage to unload a show put the show on and get it out of there so I was getting calls from uh, other venues in the state like the Capitol Center for the Arts and the uh, music hall over in Portsmouth, uh, to name a few. And I was sending people to Concord and Portsmouth and uh, up into Lebanon. And, you know, it was fun at first because you know, I, was, I was being successful. And, and then after uh, several months of doing it, it was becoming a lot of work on top of the job that I was already doing for the Colonial Theater. So I decided I, I should take that work and, and maybe make a few bucks and started doing, sending people, you know, off to these venues and, and charging for it, you know. Um, and I, I, it took a couple of years, but I got the reputation of being able to find a good crew uh, that would show up, do the job, leave, and then, and, 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 you know, uh, rinse, repeat. Until there, there was a day that, uh, like Joe, Joe said, there was a show down in um, Gillette Stadium. It was Metallica. They needed 50 people. I, they went down there and, and worked for probably five or six days on the load-in. And then uh, the teardown, it all went swimmingly well. That was the first gig where, or the first job, first show, where I actually got a chunk of money to pay people and have a profit. And it was like a light bulb went off over my head. I was like, wow, I, I could probably do this. But they all weren't Metallica. They all weren't Gillette Stadium. There was a company called Port Lighting, which still exists over in Portsmouth. Uh, did quite a few gigs for them uh, several years. It was taxing work a lot of last minute calls for people the next day. Um, that went on for several years and it was, it was probably the most challenging part of Steelman Productions in terms of um, if I were to describe my own fortitude in the company, that was the period where had I not gone beyond that the company wouldn't exist, you know. Um, until one day I got a call from a man with Live Nation uh, who wanted to speak to me about possibly supplying labor at the Orpheum Theater down in Boston. And I was uh, very attentive. I said, absolutely, I'd love to, I'd love to be involved in Boston. That would be... Uh, uh, a next level uh, occurrence for the company. Well, we made some negotiations and uh, I found myself there staffing the Orpheum Theater, which was incredible. You know, it's a lot of history and, and uh, the venue had a crew that I inherited as a company. Uh, I got further away from doing the, what, it, what we call one-offs with port lighting. And uh, I put in a few years over there, and, and, and those were, uh, it was short pay and a lot of shows, but it was, good, it was good for the promoter with Live Nation, and it was good for the company to be recognized in, in the city. You know, it was kind of a foot in the door situation. Um, until one day it was, what day was that? It was April 5th of 2013. I got a phone call from the same person that I had 
been hired to work at the Orpheum. And he said, you know, I, I think there's an opportunity at another venue in town, and I, it's uh, Fenway Park. And I, that's amazing. When, when can I start? He says, well, not yet. <laughs> we've got we've to work it out. There was another company there that they were dissatisfied with. He was dissatisfied. And uh, it wasn't until July that year. Uh, the other thing that happened on that day was the um, bombing at the marathon. That call was about three hours before the bomb went off on Boylston Street. Well, the bombs went off on Boylston Street. Uh, Needless to say, you know, the, the plans to get me into Fenway were put on the wayside for a bit. And, uh, but come that June, uh, we were uh, down at the park in negotiations and speaking to uh, uh, the people at Fenway. And uh, our first show was uh, August 5th. So it would have been, you know, four months, four four or five, four months later, <coughs> which was Jay, Jay-Z and, and Justin Timberlake. And uh, we had enormous success with that build. And I think I've got some, I, I do have some pictures there of, uh, well, okay, so let's, let's, let's back up just a little bit. Sorry, I'm scattered. This is all coming from memory. Um, when I did that show at Fenway, this was one of the first pictures I took. And it's at the Green Monster, and it is the mark of a baseball that has been <laughs> sent there by a bat. <laughs> and they're everywhere. And I first started looking at it, I was like, what are those white marks? And then as you get closer, you realize that, yeah, the baseball did that. Um, picture of some of the crew there, uh, my brother in the background, the tall guy in the yellow hat, Will, he still works with me. Uh, and this was, this was 10 years ago. So uh, that stage, I wanted to give you an idea of you know, how, how these things go together. So there's a base out with a deck, and then to the uh, right of that, that that's, towers are applied and a roof is, uh, is put into place. The roof is raised with motors, and you get the final product. That process at that time took us uh, three and a half days uh, to go from off the truck to uh, completion. And then uh, audio was applied to audio and, and uh, lighting, which we do not do at Fenway Park under Live Nation. That's handled by the local union down there, Local 11. We are considered the steel builders and the site workers, and uh, that's the, the way it remains today when, when I do a show for Live Nation at that park. Um, it was an amazing experience in that I had never dreamed when I started the company that I would be uh, responsible for a show at Fenway Park. That was the, the furthest thing from my imagination. Um, I had dreams, I just didn't know where they would, where they would end up. And uh, I'm still at the park now and, and, and very happy to be there. Um, I forget what else is, more crew. This is the crew that built that stage at that time. Um, and while we're here at this, I've got to say that the company is, is enormously successful, and I, I'm not the only one responsible for that. You know, the, the crews that I hire, the people that come to work for me, um, if, it, if it were not for them, and, and at days with some resolve uh, and a lot of hard work, I, the company wouldn't exist. I, I wouldn't be here, you know, blathering on tonight. Um, I think I make it known to them how valuable they are 
both in the uh, you know financially and and otherwise. Uh, a lot of the folks that work for me, I consider friends. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I was a lot skinnier then. Get rid of that. <laughs> um, when I think of accomplishments that the, the company has, aside from just growing every year and, and um, doing the shows, we were tasked at the beginning of 2016 to build a ski ramp at Fenway Park. Um, I know, it sounds ridiculous. This ramp on paper was 340 feet long and 128 feet high. Had an elevator. Um, and was absolutely massive. So what this picture shows is the, the white plastic floor, that's where the ramp is, is going to go, and, and these pads here, which is it's called navy mats, heavy duty, uh, and it's sitting on steel plates, which is sitting on the grass so the, the field wouldn't get damaged. That's where a massive crane was going to be sitting. Um, that's the beginning of the base out for the ramp. Uh, it was a lot of steel, a lot of scaffold, a lot of scaffold. Uh, another pretty good image of all, all the climbers in the air. Those are all folks that work for me. Um, when we first started this, I'm sorry, um, when we first started this, it was uh, January, I want to say uh, January 13th. That was the first day of the build. And we were all expecting freezing cold temperatures, which certainly was not. You can see some snow kicking around, but that snow is melting. These days were in the 50s and 60s. So uh, People were dressing down. At one point, the crew was in shorts, if I remember correctly, because it got it got into the mid '60s. Um, more of a close up. Uh, that's a reach fork, bringing materials to the deck. So that's about halfway down. Um, here's kind of a better image of. That is about half, a little better than halfway complete with um, the wood which had cleats on it to hold ice and snow and the very bottom would be where the uh, skiers and snowboarders uh, land and finish. Um, that is in the industry, that's what we, could, we call steel porn. Uh, <laughs> it's probably more interesting to me than to you, but... Um, <laughs> When I look at that, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, another angle of the, of the ski ramp, uh, that is a 270 foot crane uh, that was capable of reaching both far ends. Uh, you can see here on the back where there's some steps here at the top, there's a, uh, an elevator that was installed in there as well. And there's a lot of stories around that that I Wish I could forget. Uh, the top portion of the ramp being, being uh, having wood applied to it. The very top portion of the ramp. And I, I took this picture because how often do you get to see a snow cat on Lansdowne Street? <laughs> I did, not very often. Um, and by this time in the build, which was about three and a half weeks, um, it had decided to get cold again. Uh, we did hire uh, Killington Ski Resort, the snowmakers up there. We brought those folks down to make snow for the ramp because we, we were in great fears that there wouldn't be any snow to ski on, uh, given the weather. Uh, 
so we did bring snowmakers down and blasted for it seemed like a couple of days and then just before the event it did snow and we had too much snow <laughs> so we had to remove snow <laughs> Uh, yeah, and the snow turned into ice and got very heavy. Uh, that is the ramp basically completed, uh, with the exception of some uh, um, scenic elements that were added. Uh, the crane remained there. There was no way to get it out. Um, I, when I look at this, I, I, I still can't believe that we, we actually pulled this off. Um, the amount of resources, the number of people, the danger that was involved, the permits that were, were required, um, the expense, um, just it, it, really incredible. And it's still something to this day, but this was so many years ago, it's still one of the projects that if I'm asked what I'm impressed with, it's, it's this, yeah, monumental effort. For an event that lasted two days. <laughs> yeah. What was it? I, it was uh, snowboarding and uh, ski, downhill skiing. Yep. So they would hit the, you see the, the blue that says Polar Tech? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, that's where they would jump off of, land about halfway down the second ramp, and then stop down there. Um, it, it was quite an amazing thing to see. Um, that was, uh, that's, the, that's, that's where they stopped, that was home plate. Um, thought it was a cool pick. That's from the press box, to give another perspective of the enormity of the thing. Uh, and that's from the top. Yeah, it was higher than the light towers. Um, I can't imagine being on a set of skis or a snowboard and sending my body off of that. Uh, I, I was pretty glad to go to, back to the bottom, honestly. Uh, that's, again, the crew. Uh, pretty much everybody that was on my team that built that structure is, is in that picture. We also built ice rinks. <laughs> that was for Frozen Fenway uh, 2017. Uh, it was not a uh, NF NHL event. Uh, it was college games. Um, but that, that again was, that was a lot of fun to build. Um, where am I here? I also had a, uh, one of the stories I like to tell <laughs> involves my kids. Um, there was a show years ago. Uh, this was just in case I had time, so, and I do. Uh, years ago, we did a show uh, in New York, and I had done a number of shows for this guy, and he always paid. I paid on site. But this one event got uh, canceled by a hurricane, and we all scrambled and left. There were no checks written. Um, I paid my help. And I was expecting a check from uh, the promoter who said, yep, it's in the mail. It was one of those, yeah, it's in the mail. In the mail. So I've <laughs> I talked to a couple of people and, 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 and they were like, oh, no, he's going to pay. I did just, you know, send him a, give him a nudge. So I thought, well, I know this guy, so maybe he'll uh, listen to some humor. So I wrote him an email and said, Gary. <laughs> My son wanted to know it was for dinner. 
and I said nothing because we're waiting for the nice man in New York to pay us. The check came overnight. <laughs> A true story. Ah, uh, what else do I got here? Oh yeah, so yeah, I am running out of time here. Um, just a quick note on the pandemic. Um, that was probably the roughest time for the entertainment industry in the history of the entertainment industry in this in this country. Uh, maybe uh, all I can say is that we had a banner year lined up, and it was overnight that it vanished. You know, thousands of people lost work. Uh, the com my company lost uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, oh yeah, and I underlined, many are still paying the price, including myself. Uh, just the most challenging uh, thing that the entertainment industry has ever gone through. I always said, uh, the show business was, uh, what's the word I, I would use, uh, recession proof. And it largely is recession proof, but it's not pandemic proof. Um, luckily, we, we, we only were shut down for about 18 months. And uh, we my company was back earlier due to uh, graduation that we were holding at Fenway for Northeastern. Um, it was a tough time. Uh, we're climbing out of it. Still in business. Uh, another event that I do is Boston Calling. This is the largest event that takes place in Boston. I hire uh, about 225 to 250 people a day on show days. Uh, the entire build takes uh, build and strike takes about 10 days, and it there are about 50,000 people that attend. Uh, that's um, a picture of, the, of my uh, my boss said. The crew that was there on my end building structures. Uh, and uh, that's about all I got. So uh, thank you for attending tonight. It's been a real honor and a pleasure. Um, thanks. I do. My office is based in Keene. Yep. And where do you get all the people? Uh, I have a roster that we've, you know, just managed to keep track of who works for us and who's worked out, and who doesn't. A lot of a lot of repeat folks. Do they come from the Keene area, or do you get them out of Boston? Or? Uh, well. One of the venues that I, I, I staff is down in Manchester, um, so I really don't hire anybody out of Manchester. So there's people from Keene, Boston, really all over the place that, that'll travel to there. Not a lot of folks in Keene. Nope. Hi, my name is David. Hi. Is this on? You must be a logistical genius. I mean, I, <laughs> you know, I'm in the transportation business, and just getting stuff here and there is a challenge, and I was curious. All the steel and the and the uh, staging work is is is. Do you rent that out from uh, separate vendors, or do you have it in a warehouse in Keene or something? No, no. Actually, the, the majority of that steel came out of Baltimore, um, but stuff comes from all over. You know, I, I don't I don't own. So it. so you you. So you supply the uh, the know-how and the labor yes. to build all these structures, yep. and your phone must be going all the time. Yeah, I had to turn it off here. Yeah, I'm sure. Even even in the dead season, it, it rings. I should mention uh, to people who may not know that David Beltet, uh, who just spoke, is the chairman of the board here at the Jaffrey Civic Center. 
Questions, comments, Peter. Uh, on the ski jump, you showed us. Yeah. Did you design that? No. Who, who, nope. who designed it that you can build from? Uh, that was a combined effort. Um, there were a lot of people that were that were. There was a structural engineer, um, a licensed builder out of out of Massachusetts. There were. Uh, in terms of aesthetics, people with soft goods, uh, FIS was involved, uh, USSA was involved, um, both the skiers and uh, snowboarders. So, massive effort. Kurt, a lot of people I work with have a terrifically hard time attracting and retaining skilled labor. Is that your case as well? I mean, sometimes you got to get these things, you know, rolling pretty quickly. And uh, you know, how do you how do you do it? So, uh, in the entertainment industry, uh, in particular, my company, I adopted very early on, after some really hard lessons with some employees. Um, Paying on time and paying weekly and treating people as employees and not uh, uh, 1099s, you know what that is, right? Um, the willingness to work uh, with you and for you is, is a little bit uh, more appreciated. So I, the company pays whether I've been paid or not, if we do a job within the previous week, um, come Friday, you're paid. And that's, it's a little unusual for my business, but uh, it goes greatly appreciated. Ed, do we have any online questions? That's a good question. <laughs> Is he gonna shut up? <laughs> All right, in the room, let me give you the microphone. Is the microphone working? How many full-time employees do you have, and are some of your crew full-time year-round? Uh, that's a good question. There's one full-time person in this company, and it's me. Um, for no other reason is that the, there's, the shows are so scattered. Um, I don't have anything that goes 52 weeks a year or even six months out of the year. So it's very seasonal. Um, there are people that make uh, a decent living with my company, but they're still considered part-time. Um, if I could bridge that gap somehow and uh, make them full-time, I would, um, but I can't. Who else? I'm Marn Wotazic, his wife, but my question is this. The scaffolding, did it all go back to Baltimore? It did. Okay. Yep. <laughs> it can just be stored somewhere. Well, it gets used. Okay. Yeah, it just gets reused. Yep. Michael. Hi, Kurt. Hey. I was just curious about the Boston Calling event. I'm not familiar with it. What, what goes on at that event? So that is four to five stages. It is. Uh, it was an event that uh, came about after the the bombing, um, and it was, uh, there was a saying down there with Boston Strong, which was uh, uh, a logo slash brand, uh, and the promoters who had been doing some shows there in the local area um, decided to put this together, and, and the city welcomed it as part of, a, you know, rejuvenation, recovery, and uh, the event was at City Hall Plaza both Labor Day and, uh, or I'm sorry, Memorial Day, respectively, and Labor Day, uh, the city got sick of that. <laughs> and the show just got too big, too popular. Uh, there wasn't enough infrastructure there. There weren't enough police. There were too many people that weren't involved with the event. So it made a lot of sense for the promoters to bring it down to the uh, Harvard Coliseum, which is confined and closed, parking, et cetera, close, you know, still in Boston, um, close to the college. Um, it's a really, it's a really cool event. There's a lot of, lot of high-end acts there. Yeah. 
Well, we're all impressed, for sure. There's one online question. Um, I, I don't understand it, but maybe you will. Did you see the film Cinema Paradiso? And if so, what did you think about it, and how did you relate to it? <laughs> Did you see the my, my, film my Cinema my Paradiso? My grandfather come back from the grave. And, uh, we did, my father did play that uh, when it came out. And yeah, I did see it and I liked it. I wouldn't say that it influenced me uh, at the time, barring you know, some romantic feelings towards the film, because uh, it, did, it did tug at my heartstrings. Um, and in retrospect, I, I, I think there is some similarity there, you know. Not the uh, pretty Italian woman, though. <laughs> I was going to say, I still want to know, how did you splice the film together at the theater? Uh, and <laughs> old tricks, Joe. So, uh, <laughs> you don't have full-time employees, but you have employees. Yes. How many? Uh, there's, uh, right now we're at about a 780. Pre-pandemic I had 1,005. Wow. Yeah. And they're not independent contractors. They are your employees. They are employees. They are freelance employees, but they are employees. And so there's a fair amount of bookkeeping. You don't do that. <laughs> Hey, Glenn, you should come. <laughs> Glenn's my accountant. He's uh, he's well aware. Yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, um, a lot of compliance issues, a lot of tax issues. Um, uh, but I sleep at night. I sleep at night. Uh, I can just keep asking questions, but ah, good. Here's one. Do you just want to just speak briefly to the something that people might not think about, but you know you pay pay a vast amount of insurance. You know this is a very dangerous dangerous field, and it's uh, it's a large expense. It is, it, and it's uh, a necessary one. I carry uh, ten million dollars in liability, um, and I have a relatively large comp bill. Uh, but it's part of doing business, and, and uh, I pass that expense along to my clients. Who won't hire you unless you have the insurance. Yep. Yeah. I was going to ask, what's next? You've obviously gone from Pembroke, where they said, work hard, took that advice. Here you have built this company. Where are you going from here? Uh... Hopefully home to dinner. Uh, <laughs> I know. Uh, so we do staff uh, an arena down in Manchester, SNHU Arena. So we have several shows happening there. Um, I'm involved with uh, golf at Fenway, which we set up the, for the first week in November. Uh, we're involved with the football game that happens down, the bowl game. Uh, it is kind of a light winter. I don't have any major event. Uh, but last year we did the NHL Winter Classic at Fenway, which consumed pre-Christmas, uh, much of my holiday, and uh, post-holiday. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm okay taking the, the time off this year. Well, Kurt, uh despite the competition from other events, it's a wonderful turnout and I think a very appreciative one. I'll tell you, I loved hearing what you do, how this came about, and an excellent way to start our Stories to Share season. So thank you so much. How did I hear about it? Uh, uh, <laughs> I have a friend who lives in uh, Spofford, and she knows everybody. And 
The reason she's not here, and apologetically, is that she's very involved in this big mountain show across the street. <laughs> now, uh, quickly returning to our lineup, uh, take a look. Uh, Cy Montgomery does not write about animals. She gets to know them. Anyone who's ever read one of her books knows that uh, she takes it very seriously, and she's much in demand, and she's coming here out of the goodness of her heart. Speaking of the mountain, Dan Scully, an architect, Mary Islin, who paints sheep, paints the mountain, uh, and raises sheep. Dick Ober, the head of New Hampshire Public Charities. Kate McNally, expert on folk music, Susie Spickle, a naturalist at the Harris Center, and last, Dr. Caruso, who until recently was the head of Cheshire Medical. The new doctor is taking over basically right now, and we will hear from Don Caruso on the subject of health care. So as you can see, we're not running out of people from the Monadnock region who have something to say, nor are we sticking to just one subject I can tell you Kurt Steelman is the only speaker this year who builds ski areas in Fenway <laughs> Park. Please stay. Uh, David Beltet serves as chief cook, bottle washer, and bartender. And next month, please come and you will have a chance to meet our new executive director along with Cy Montgomery. Ed, thank you again. Thank you.